Tonight on Backyard Farmer, we have a special program coming to you from Laritzen Botanical Gardens in Omaha. Join us for an hour of good gardening right here on Backyard Farmer. your host tonight as we are in this absolutely spectacular wonderful place on a beautiful day answering all those great gardening questions. This is a taped show so we will not be able to answer all those phone calls. You can still send us an email that address is byf at unl.edu. That will be for a future show. Please tell us where you live and give us as much information as you can so we can give you a good answer. And as always we start our show with samples Kyle, you are up with a beastie that is probably just raising its ugly head. That's right. Um, I brought something that is, is really just starting to come out now, and so it's time to really think about dealing with these. So what I have with me is our familiar evergreen bagworms. And um, so these emerge in, you know, usually late May to early June. And so for much of the state, they've really just been emerging within the last week or so, maybe the very southeastern part of the state um, the last few weeks. But um, you can see these little caterpillars here. I'll try to point out one here. So we have the bags right here next to my finger. And so those little caterpillars are, are really quite hard to spot at this stage. They're, they're not very easy to see. They produce these, uh, the silk case. And then as they're feeding on the plant material, they, they clip some of that off and they glue on that material um, onto their case. And so it really makes them very inconspicuous, very well camouflaged and, and hard to see. Um, so these caterpillars, they'll feed throughout the rest of the summer until at least through August um, into September, at which point um, they'll mature into adults. And then only the males will have wings. And the females are wingless. They'll only stay in the bag and the male will We'll find those females, mate with them. Um, they'll lay new eggs, which will uh, overwinter and then emerge again next year. So dealing with these, they can be quite problematic. Um, despite the name evergreen bagworms, they do feed on deciduous plants as well, though they're not really a big problem there, but can cause really significant issues on, on any of our uh, evergreen trees and shrubs. So the time to deal with these is really right now when they're very small. Um, less than a half of an inch is generally the rule of thumb for treating these. At this stage, they can be effectively treated with BT, um, but once they start getting a little bit larger, over a half inch, um, so like as we're getting into July for sure, um, you can treat still with, um, with something like a pyrethroid, uh, biofenthrin, or carbaryl, but efficacy goes significantly down. So really think about treating these as soon as possible if you've had uh, a history of issues in, in your landscape. Um, to avoid, you know, those populations really exploding again. Thank you, Kyle. All right, Rock, what's up? So I have two weeds that many of you may be familiar with, um, dandelion and prostrate knotweed. And the reason I'm showing these weeds is not because we're going to suggest any way to control them, because this is like the worst time to be thinking about controlling broadleaf weeds in the garden, in, in, the, in the lawn, because We've got susceptible fruits and vegetables that are growing. We've got high temperatures that'll cause it to volatilize and, and injure those non-target plants. There are optimal times to control both of these weeds and they are different. Prostrate knotweed is a winter annual. So basically it germinates um, very, very early. It's an early summer annual, excuse me. Germinates very early in the year and it by this time of year, it's really actively growing, and it's an annual, so it's gonna die on its own when we get into the really hot temperatures. We're not there yet, so you're just gonna be wasting herbicide and potentially causing injury to non-target plants. Dandelion, on the other hand, the best time to control that is in the fall. So I continue to get calls, oh, my lawn is so thin because of the bad weather. You know, what do I do to control these weeds that are invading that dead turf from, from drought stress and those kind of things? And there are optimal times to treat these weeds. Now is not the time. Let's avoid the injury to the susceptible vegetables and um, other broadleaf trees and plants that we like to grow in the garden. So common weeds, 
but don't be trying to spray anything on them now. It's just a waste of time um, because you don't get very good control and you can cause some injury. The only weed you should be controlling now is yellow nut sedge, and you've got about two weeks for the optimal timing to control nuttle, yellow nut sedge right about now. Don't have a sample of that. Excellent. All right, Lauren. Well, Kim, I brought along tonight uh, some leaf spots that look like a disease, uh, but they're not. So one of our garden vegetable plants that's very sensitive to watering during uh, sunny days is dry, or our green beans. Uh, and that's what I have here. And most of our avid gardeners know not to really water our plants when the sun's out really hot because that, inner, that heat will, will accumulate in those water droplets that go onto the edge of the leaves and uh, that will burn that leaf tissue. Uh, green beans, again, are really sensitive to that. So on this, you can kind of see distribution-wise, you can see how the leaves are kind of on the edge. Some of them are, are spotted along where there would be, you know, veins where water would accumulate. And then when that bright sun comes out, uh, that would then result in uh, that tissue being burnt. So it's just a physical burn. Uh, it's just basically a, a, a leaf, you know, some people may call it scorch, but scorch is actually a disease. But this is just a leaf burning uh, from water accumulation, just from from watering at the wrong time of day. All right, thanks, Lauren. Okay, John, uh, great tomato plant. Right, so it's not the best looking tomato plant, and you might say, okay, well, I planted my tomatoes back in May. Like, what are you doing with the tomato plant? And I really brought this today <coughs> to talk about um, that it's not too late to plant tomatoes if you didn't get them in, or we have people that have maybe some issues with their tomatoes, a lot of the um, herbicide drift issues earlier in the season. You can really plant tomatoes in several of the warm season crops until um, mid-June to late June and even into early July. So tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, uh, even things like beans and cucumbers and squash, melons, all of those can still be planted in the garden. So if you missed that opportunity or you've already had some herbicide drift or other damage, you can replace things if you can find them and find good quality. So this is sort of leggy. I removed all the, you know, the bottom branches here and I will plant that all the way down uh, just to give it a good start. But it will still produce. You're not, you're not going to have the whole season, but you're going to get uh, some production on those plants. All right. Thanks, guys. Kyle, you get the first round of picture questions. Um, the first one comes to us from a little greenhouse in Omaha. They found this little guy sort of wandering around. They want to know what he is and will he be damaging anything or should they just let it be, let it be? Yeah, this is, I'm not 100% sure, but I lean towards um, salt marsh tiger moth caterpillar. So um, usually the, the hairs are longer towards the front of the head. Here it looks like they're kind of short. And so I don't know if that's just kind of um, a, an artifact of, of the image, the angle of the image or not. But if that's what it is, um, it's probably not a big concern. They do have a really broad host range. Um, usually they feed on like uh, broadleaf, weedy plants. So not a huge concern. When they're uh, young caterpillars, they will feed in, you know, large aggregates. And then um, as they, they mature, they kind of wander off um, and, and will feed individually. So they can go into a number of vegetables. But if you're not seeing a lot of them, it's probably not anything I would be too worried about. If you do see any damage, um, injury to, to like vegetables or something else, or you're seeing uh, quite a few caterpillars in, in, the, uh, in this, uh, the setting, the, I think it was a greenhouse, then at that point you could consider treating with like BT. That's pretty effective, especially for the younger ones, the younger caterpillars or spinosad. All right, you have two more questions in this round. Both of these are, what is this caterpillar? The first is from Omaha. It is on the underside of a rhubarb leaf. And the second is a caterpillar on a pea vine. Yeah, so this, this first one is uh, a Nessus uh, sphinx moth. So this is a, a hornworm. Um, they usually are associated with um, plants in the grape family. Um, so I, I'm not sure if, if it's necessarily feeding on on the rhubarb or not maybe they there has been some reports of them feeding on some um, peppers some other solanaceous plants so maybe but probably not anything to be too concerned about um, they're pretty conspicuous so i would say just hand pick them if you're seeing them and that's about all that needs to be done um, the second one similarly it looks like a white line sphinx um, pretty much the same thing they, they have a broader host range um, they're pretty conspicuous, easy to see. I would just hand pick them and, and not be too concerned about anything. 
Excellent. Thanks, Kyle. Okay, Rock, your first one comes to us from Omaha. What is causing these brown lines in the turf? He's done two of a four-step fertilizer program. They've had a lot of rain. Yeah, that has nothing to do with the lawn program that they did. These are tracks from a riding mower. And what happens when they get the turf gets drought stressed, um, you know, it can get a little bit lose some water and then you crush that. It doesn't have the capacity to hold the lawn tire up and then it dies and desiccates and turns brown. Good news is it doesn't affect the crown of the grass plant. So they're going to recovery. It's just going to look really bad for, you know, a couple of weeks. And if it continues to stay hot, it'll just be a little bit slower to recover. But those are tracks from the mower. All right. Uh, your second one also comes to us from Omaha. This is a bluegrass lawn, sudden yellowing, uh, sloped front yard. The area is about four to six feet wide. Areas on both sides are normal. He did do weed and feed to the yard. The rest is okay. Yeah, it's hard to tell from this picture, Kim, primarily because uh, we, we don't have a real good close up the leaf to see if it has a disease or if there's some insect injury or something like that. And we just had a really rough year for a lot of plant material, but especially the lawns, um, especially lawns that weren't irrigated at the frequency we'd like or if they were over irrigated uh, to try to cover for the drought. So it's going to be really difficult to say anything. That could be any number of pathogens or, or non-pathogenic or non-biological issues. And, and plus, even if it was pathogenic, I'm not a big fan of recommending fungicides for home lawns. It just seems like a waste of chemical for something that's not going to work very well. All right. And one more picture. This is actually a Lincoln viewer, and there is a four-foot square area between sidewalk and curb that every year starts out green, then goes brown, never greens up again. Yeah, so that, you know, I, if I look really closely at the picture, there does appear to be some Ascochyta leaf blight, which is a pathogen that the, we have no fungicides for, but it's usually triggered by, you know, heat stress and droughty conditions. So I think you've just got, you know, that parkway that heats up quicker and, you know, it's a, it's once again, it's been a bad year for lawns in general, and there's really not much that could be done. They did say that it repeated over years, so perhaps there's something else going on, but we really need a, we need something to be taken to the diagnostic clinic so they can take a closer look at it. But right now it looks like there may be a pathogen that comes in in drought stress turf. And so I'm thinking it's mostly physical with drought stress. All right, thanks, Rock. Kim, did they say that was a square? Mm-hmm. I wonder if it was something under the ground, Rock. They have a piece of plywood from building or some rock or something that could be- That's entirely possible. Take a screwdriver out and poke around a little bit. They might find something. Yeah, I've I wonder how that shallow before. it would be. It could be shallow soil, it would sure, stress more. absolutely. That's an yeah. interesting question. Just a thought. All right, uh, Lauren, your first con comes to us from Denver, Colorado. <clears throat> Found this odd, beautiful floral-like mushroom. <laughs> what is it? Well, and uh, this is another uh, just beautiful uh, fungus that, that our viewer captured. Uh, and this is one that's in our Earth Star fungi group. So if the viewers look at, at Earth Star, Earth, look up Earth Stars, and there will be a lot of different species, and uh, many times they will be darker than this picture. Uh, and as they mature, they will darken, and many times can be kind of hard on the surface. So, Perfect. Yeah, uh, you Star. have two pictures on this next question. It comes to us from North Platte. She has uh, Mardigan lilies. This is year three. And they are all of a sudden just looking dreadful, and every other lily in the bed, short of the Mardigans, is looking good. Okay, and, and, and Kim, I meant to ask you this before the show. So, are Mardigan lilies supposed to be chlorotic? No. Okay, That's, <laughs> that makes this question easier then. <laughs> so, uh, I do believe in this case that, that there may be some sort of a, of a bulb uh, infecting fungus. Uh, it, most likely, many of our bulbs are infected by fusarium species, which cause a rot of the bulb. And, and that would result in, in that lack of nutrient uptake, potentially. Um, the other thing, I guess, would be if it was too wet where they're at to make sure that, that they're having good soil drainage. But it, it does look, when you have that much of an effect, um, it really makes me think of something that's limiting nutrient uptake, uh, and that could be uh, some sort of a, of, a, of, a, of a bulb rot or something, especially if they just put them in and they're newer. All right, and one more picture. This comes to us from Atlantic, Iowa. Uh, she's getting spots on her rhubarb, and she has been pulling the spotted leaves off. Okay, and, I, and, that, and that's a good thing to do. Um, and, and even if you don't know what it is, uh, when we see leaf spots that, uh, particularly in this case, where you can actually see some rings uh, on the, the leaves and it, it has a, a, a pattern to it, uh, those are most likely some sporulation. There's an ascochyta leaf spot. 
that Infex uh, rhubarb, which it looks a lot like this, and I'd suspect that's what it is. Um, a couple things to keep in mind if you can avoid uh, overhead irrigation, uh, that's going to help uh, for any of our leaf spots. And then removing of, of those leaves and making sure you're, you're using sanitation at the end of the season too will help as well. Um, some good mulch at the base to kind of cover that up at the end of season or next spring to make sure you're doing that will also reduce that. All right, thank you, Lauren. John, your first question comes to us from Omaha. This is a Montmorency cherry. Uh, this is the first year it's had an abundance of cherries, but they're very tiny. And we've heard the same thing about Nanking cherries. And the question is, why are all these cherries so small this year? So this year, one of the things that could be going on is that we're very dry and fruits require a lot of water in order to, to grow and, and to sort of, as they're ripening especially, to sort of uh, to become bigger and juicier. Uh, and so you're likely going to have those smaller cherries because of the lack of moisture. Uh, it's a little too late to go out and water now to get them bigger because they are ripening. Um, <clears throat> but keep that in mind for the future. Also looking at, you know, if you have a lot of cherries on there, the more you have, then the smaller they're going to be. So some pruning might help with that as well. And that's actually a trick that a lot of uh, fruit growers use. So uh, grape growers that grow grapes for wine specifically underwater their grapes because you want more grape and more grape flavor and less water when you create your vine. So you are, uh, I guess, in store for some maybe potent uh, cherries uh, if you can keep the birds from eating them. All right. Uh, this is also an Omaha viewer, John. Uh, smoke bush, they've had it four years. It looks like golden spirit maybe. The tops have died back and it has never smoked. So <laughs> what's the deal? Well, we're seeing a lot of this uh, winter damage with a lot of different shrubs and trees. Uh, and so we get that die back from, from dry out, uh, some from freezing, but more from dry out in the winter. And we're just seeing lots of things do that now as you know, we, we see our different weather and climate patterns. Uh, and so unfortunately, this is one of those shrubs that bloom on old growth. So all that stuff on the top is the new growth. So as long as it keeps dying back, you're never going to get blooming. So, you know, you can keep, keep trying for a few more years uh, to see, but as, if it keeps dying back like that, you're never really going to get the, the blooming. You're never going to get the smoke. Exactly. All right, one more picture for you, John. This comes to us from Central City. Uh, we had several of these with the red foliaged maples mm -hmm. and the top died. And her question is, she's got the top's dead. She's got all these little bitty uh, pieces of maple from the base. Is this... Uh, a goner or give it a shot? Well, I mean, you can try with, with what's coming up if you want to pick a new leader, but we see this happen when we have trees that die or we have a lot of die back in the top. Uh, basically, it, it's a hormone uh, signal that, you know, there's hormones in the tips of branches that control growth downward uh, on, the, on the branches. And once the ends of those branches die, we get growth up from the base. Um, so it's probably not an ideal situation. So I would probably uh, not try it, but you know, if you want to experiment and see what happens, that's fine too. All right, thank you, John. Well, like Backyard Farmer, Lortz and Gardens has been helping people connect with nature for very many years. We have Spencer Barrick and Maria Velez who are going to be telling us about their particular journey helping people connect with nature. come along this path here and go down to the Garden of the Glen. That's my favorite garden. It's like a little cubby hole and then you hear the water running and I don't know, there's a peacefulness down there. I really do enjoy the serenity of the Japanese garden in the mornings just because it's right before the sun is crested. Um, you have the light, but it's not bright, and so you can kind of, there's that, that mound that they have in the middle. And I like to sit there on that little walkway that they have that goes over the water in the mornings. Peace, serenity, words that members Maria Velez and Spencer Barrick use to describe Lords and Gardens. A beautiful green oasis that both were drawn to because of the one and a half miles of walking trails. I've been walking here since, well, actually before it was a garden, when it was a landfill. And uh, when they did start the garden, there was just a little patch of tulips. 
I used to walk anyway. And I thought, well, I'll start walking at the gardens. And, you know, the, I'll see all the plants and see things that are different, you know, that you don't see walking on the street. I actually was initially gifted a membership with a plus one from a family member who they live in another town that has something similar to this. And I had mentioned while visiting them that, hey, this is really great to have so close to your house. And so they in return, you know, looked into Lauritzen and got me a membership. I like the Japanese garden a lot for when I'm here early, doing my morning walk, trying to relax. But then the garden in the Glen and like the, the crane garden is where I go if I'm really trying to get in my workout where I, I'll walk several miles. At our core, we really want people to come here to connect to nature in some way, whether that's through photography, through birding, exercise. I, mean, I find people reading on a bench sometimes or meditating in this space. It's just um, kind of a space where you can do your own thing, but connect in your own unique and individual way. Those walks were how Spencer and Maria started connecting to nature. As they continue to make routine visits, the plants around them have come to hold a deeper meaning. Given what I do, I work with a lot of people, I work in a loud music venue every day, and it's nice to not have to drive an hour away to get this green time, to get the quiet time that we have around us, and uh, to kind of forget you're in the middle of the city for a little bit. And uh, you know, there's plenty of ways to de-stress, and this has kind of become mine. We've had some amazing moments here. I actually engaged to my partner uh, several weeks here ago, and we're gonna get married next year. This place has become a special place for us, and so us being able to de-stress together here, you know, together every week helps a lot. It's my church. <laughs> That's what I call it. When I am troubled, when I have a lot of stress, which I do right now, you know, with my daughter, uh, it's a peacefulness inside. It calms me. The biggest joy of working in a place like this that is for, you know, for the public is seeing the interactions, how people perceive the landscape, hearing their thoughts. But I think that's the most meaningful part for me is seeing people kind of get what the garden, how the garden is you know, intended to be used, which really is kind of an open book and really is for the community to use in the ways that they find meaning in. You know, like Maria's grown with the garden and then you see like potential there with like some of have these big life moments here in the garden space and there's so much potential for more, right? And um, I know the, the meaning that this space has for both of them and you just want that for everyone. The garden can really be a powerful place and we want to say thank you to Marie and Spencer for sharing their stories with us. All right, Kyle, round two. Uh, the first one comes to us from Wakefield. Found this little bugger on the deck. What is it? Yeah, so and again, another uh, Sphinx moth, but this is the adult. This is uh, an Acumon Sphinx. Acumon Sphinx, all right. Uh, Emerson, Nebraska is next. She has a hibiscus that is covered with, uh, she's calling them white spots and insects. What is that and how does she get rid of it? Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, so um, these look like they're probably melanaphids. Um, certainly some, some kind of aphid here on the, the bud. Um, melanaphids are, are fairly common on hibiscus and um, will concentrate on the buds. Um, the good thing here is it looks like I'm, I'm seeing some uh, mummies. So these are basically um, aphids that have been parasitized by, by a little wasp and they consume the inside and basically just turn it into a mummy. So that's what those big kind of white spots are. Um, so that's good. You have some biocontrol already um, taking effect. Um, otherwise, you can spray them with an insecticidal soap. That's really effective for, for aphids. All right. And one more question. This one comes to us from Fremont. This is a viewer who has all these little tiny white insects in her containers. What are those and what does she do? Yeah, aphids again. All the little white specks um, around the, the base, those are the caskins. So like that's the, as they grow, they have to shed their, their exoskeleton. Um, and so that's what they've shed and left behind. So it's aphids again, um, and basically same, same thing. You can uh, spray, manage with um, insecticidal soap. It's very effective. 
All right, thanks. Rock, your first uh, two pictures come to us from Benson, Omaha area. And he's uh, wondering about some ID here. Does he have poison ivy? And what is the other one? And he has been using a salt vinegar dish soap method to try to control what he thinks is the poison ivy. He's very allergic. So what does he have and what does he do? So this is going to be a problem. That is, um, leaves a three, let it be. I think you all know that. And this is definitely... Um, Definitely poison ivy. In the first picture, there was some Boston ivy in there, which is a desirable Second picture. Second picture, sorry. I, couldn't, I can't see it real well. Here, bottom line is it's, there was a desirable species in the second one. Um, the, the, the concoction, for lack of a better term, that he's describing is not going to be good on a perennial wood, woody species. Um, because she is so hypersensitive, you can't go in with the glove of death or the things that we describe on the show to try to get in close. And I, we wouldn't recommend that for anybody, even if you're not hypersensitive to uh, poison ivy or stinging nettles, some people aren't. Um, so this is gonna, you're gonna have to cut back or trim back as close as you can away from the, you know, the, down as close to the ground as you can and then physically let it desiccate on the vine. But that's still not a very effective control and it will grow back. Um, so, you know, given the fact that he's hypersensitive and he wants to try an organic method, there really isn't anything he's gonna be able to do. Maybe hire a professional in this case, cause that, is clearly in a spot that's going to be problematic with the other plants in the garden. So that's not a great recommendation, but that's really all we can do for poison ivy and somebody that's hypersensitive. All right, and you have a vine now mm -hmm. that uh, she's used brush killer with 2,4-D. She wants to know what it is. Uh, this is catbriar or greenbriar or Simlax. It's um, fairly common. If uh, the brush killers will work on it, it certainly uh, is tenacious and you know, you're going to be, viney plants tend to have trouble translocating that herbicide to it, but if they're willing to try that herbicide out, they should have pretty good luck. All right, thank you. Uh, Lauren, you have two picks on this one, um, and then one on the next one, and two on the next one, and all of these are tomatoes. So, what's going on? Okay, well, on this first one, uh, I believe you've got a lot of leaf cupping and curling. Uh, so, in this case, it looks a lot like we would see with the growth regulator herbicide. Uh, the one thing that can rule this out is if we have a group of tomato plants and just one of them were to look like this, there are some of our tomato viruses that can result in some of these symptoms. Uh, in that case, you would rogue it out, but if it's one plant and you don't have others to check, I would guess it's the growth regulator herbicide. All right. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, you have, I think, two more questions that are also still tomatoes. Okay. Same and, thing? And these are still um, leaf cupping curling. This one is a little bit different. It had some milder turns on the leaf, which could be the result of, of rapid temperature changes and moisture availability. Um, so the one that has uh, the, the lower level of, of leaf cupping and curling um, could be just, just the uh, rapid change and rapid growth uh, that we can see. Uh, and this leaf rolling as well uh, could be similar in the same way. Okay, and then the curly leaf de disease is maybe your last two. So, yeah, so in, and even the curly leaf, there, there are some viruses that can do this, but uh, again, um, it, it may not be that. So, it, you know, depending on when this picture was taken, water availability, rapid growth, these things, uh, you could see that. So uh, if it's just one of the plants in your garden, though, and again, you've got several tomatoes and just one is exhibiting these types of symptoms when we see curling or rolling of leaves and things, then I, I would suggest roguing that out. All right, thank you. John, you have three pictures on this first one. This comes to us from Lakewood, Colorado. It is uh, eggplant, black spots, dots, and curling leaves. Yeah, so unfortunately, eggplant is sort of like one of those magnets for a lot of insects. Uh, and I think what we have going on, the, the black, the darkness, uh, I see some spots. Uh, we can have some flea beetle feeding. Uh, flea beetles love eggplant. Uh, and so that's one thing that we look out for. And also, I think maybe some aphid damage with like the, the dark patches uh, that we see on those leaves. So what I would do uh, would be to... Um, Really uh, look at the leaves, see if you can see some aphids underneath, uh, and you can just spray those off with water. Um, you can also, you know, do some, some things like neem. Uh, neem oil can control some of those insects, and also uh, there's pyrethrin or pyrethrum 
Uh, some of those are, you can get an organic version or you can get a, a synthetic version as well. Uh, but we have uh, several of those insect issues, I think, going on with that eggplant. All right, and two pictures for this next one. This is peppers, and this is the Millard area. Uh, really wondering whether uh, this is herbicide damage. I think it is. So Lauren was talking about tomatoes, and we see that sort of weird growth and the cupping and the things going on with it. And I think that's what's happening here. The way I sort of tell people that you can differentiate between herbicide damage and other things like just curling from heat or drought is that if you can lay the leaf flat in your hand and you can sort of flatten it back out to normal, it's probably not herbicide. But if, you, if it's actually growing that way and you can't sort of flatten it back out, that's probably herbicide damage because it's a growth regulator and causing weird issues with uh, the growth pattern of the leaf. All right, thank you, John. Well, our garden is in the ground and already off to a great start, but we also have some very interesting trees and shrubs. So here is Terry James to tell us what is going on right now in the Backyard Farmer Garden. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're gonna talk about our woody plants. We have a whole bunch of fruit trees that have some fruit on it. We're gonna have to thin those out so that we don't have too heavy of a fruit load. And we have some fantastic flowering shrubs. Our dogwoods are just about ready to flower and our button bush is just about ready to flower. Those are two fantastic great pollinators for that kind of late spring, mid, early summer flowering. So if you don't have any shrubs in your garden and you'd like to kind of add some of those bigger shrubs, stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden and check them out and see if they'll work in your backyard. Welcome back to Backyard Farmer. Coming up later in the show, Kyle Broderick is going to talk about all those tomatoes and all those weird things that can come up with them. Remember, we're not taking your calls because this is a taped show. You can still send us those emails for a later show, but right now, of course, it is time for those plants of the week. Well, those with uh, pollinator or butterfly gardens might uh, know some of these. So we have our butterfly milkweed right here. Uh, that is our common uh, butterfly milkweed that a lot of people grow in their butterfly pollinator gardens. Uh, it is slow to break dormancy. Uh, it's full sun and slow to spread. Uh, the one thing is aphids love it. Uh, so you will often see those sort of reddish orange aphids all over it later in the season, especially when it starts producing its pods. And then we also have this uh, long head prairie cone flower, uh, which is really fun. Uh, really interesting looking. It's a perennial full sun plant uh, and uh, it can survive a dry and what we would call thin soils. So doesn't need a lot of organic matter. It can be a, a, a good sort of uh, uh, plant almost anywhere in the garden. All right. Thank you, John. A beautiful combination. All right, Kyle, uh, this comes to us from Pierce, Nebraska. We sort of answered in a lightning round, but not really without pictures. It's a citrus and she has all these little brown deals on it. So what is that and what does she do? Yeah, this is a brown soft scale and it is, um, it's highly uh, polyphagous. It feeds on about everything on, and loves citrus. So um, it has overlapping generations, basically like there's extended egg lane. So there's not a lot you can do other than, you know, what I would suggest is try, you know, if you can prune out or like rub, scrape those off, smash them, that's probably going to be your best bet. All right, and we have uh, from Lincoln a viewer who has uh, hawthorns, and she is seeing both brown leaves and some little, right, uh, little white things. So what's she got going on here? Yeah, the brown leaves are uh, definitely characteristic of hawthorn leaf miner. That's um, actually a, a sawfly or a, the larva of, of a wasp, and they feed in between the upper and lower leaf um, surface, and you know, not really a concern overall. They, they're, they're probably done feeding at this point and have already left the leaves. So it's just cosmetic. It shouldn't harm the tree overall. Um, the hawthorn, the white spots are the hawthorn mealybug. Those can be a problem. Um, they have kind of a, a complicated biology with the crawlers moving um, in spring and then again in fall. So those are kind of the two times to you would try to treat. Um, so you could use like um, a horticultural oil um, in 
like around May or so, and then again um, in fall, you could also try less effective probably in the fall, or you could also do a synthetic, or ex excuse me, a systemic, um, like a midocloprid as a soil drench. Um, do that after bloom though. All right, thank you. Rock, it's vine night again. This one apparently has come up in, oh, we have a spider. I'm. Geez, I forgot. How could I forget my very favorite beast? That's not a vine. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's got vine-like legs, so <laughs> they just want to know what that spider is, Kyle. It's a spider. I honestly, <laughs> I think we're looking at the underside, and so I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a spider. All right, now we have a vine rock. Maybe you've got the the vine spider now. This is a coming up in buffalo grass and in other lawn spots and in landscape beds. What is it? This is honey vine milkweed. It's a, it's a annual. Um, it can be clipped off at the base and generally doesn't survive that, right? So you want to do that if you can. Uh, certainly it's uh, susceptible to herbicide, but this isn't when we would be trying to control it. Um, so honey vine milkweed, it's an annual and it will squirt a little bit of milky sap when you uh, clip it. All right, uh, a Valley Nebraska viewer is asking how to kill purslane and keep it from growing back. Okay, purslane is an interesting weed. It's very fleshy. Actually, there are ornamental varieties of purslane. Um, the herbicides don't work very well on them when it's a mature, when it grows. And if this is, these are two very mature specimens. Um, and they just don't work, right? So, and here, you don't want to hoe them because any portion of the leaf or a portion of the stem that has a leaf attached will regrow, especially in the moisture environments. And I'm going to make this recommendation. It is very tasty in salads. So if it hasn't been sprayed with herbicides or have, you haven't had any herbicides in that environment, purslane is great in a salad. Pull it up from the tap root. Make sure you don't leave any pieces behind. Wash it off, chop it up. A little balsamic vinaigrette and a nice big ribeye. <laughs> I'm in heaven. <laughs> All right. And on that note, you have one more picture. This is, comes to us from Malcolm. Uh, this is wildflower. She thinks this is uh, something called fiddle neck. And she's uh, wondering, is it going to take over the earth? So fiddle neck is a really interesting native to most of the United States. It's an annual and a prolific seeder. Um, so yeah, it's probably going to reseed itself. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is really a huge pollinator attractant. So if you have a pollinator garden or you like having the pollinators in your garden, then certainly this is one, something not something you want to control. And if I remember right, Kim, it was in a wildflower garden anyway, right. so I just leave it be. The voice in my head is asking, how does it work in salad? I was just going to say, I'm not sure how is it in salad, but if you've got a ribeye there, nobody cares. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lauren, you have uh, three pictures for this first one. Uh, this is a viewer who has a spruce, and he's sent us many pictures. We just pulled the best ones. It's got some issues. The, the big thing also... There's, res there's rosin, I think, on one of the pictures, and then he has used the, the uh, foliage or all the, all the spent needles as a mulch under this. So what are we, what are we gonna say about this? Well, what's, and, what's causing this death here? And, and, and there's a few things. So in this case, you, know, you see a lot of needle drop. Um, and I can't really tell from the photos, there, there are several needle cast diseases that, that could be affecting this. It does look a little bit like it's on one side more than the other, which would also match up to his disease. So in this case, I'd recommend a sample be submitted to, to actually get some good management. And how about all that, like this much mulch of all that needle underneath? Well, that's all going to end up being inoculum to continue and spread. So uh, if you can, you're never going to get that raked up though, Kim. So I mean, I try, try to avoid it, but yeah, you might try covering it up with some other mulch, but that would be the best you could do. All right. Uh, then you have two pictures on this next one. Uh, this is also blue spruce. They lost uh, several in a windbreak line. They were in construction soil, but they were well cared for. They're wondering, is it canker? And then this is the root system. These were in the ground almost eight years before yeah, they so, died. So with the canker that was in the previous picture, um, anytime we have uh, drier conditions and stress, uh, a lot of our trees are more susceptible to cankers. Uh, so in this case, when you see pitch like that uh, on any of the main trunk and then that tree dies, it's most likely dying from that canker situation. Um, I did not see anything on the roots that really flagged something that, that I would identify as a different disease. So I, I really think we're probably dealing with cankers, uh, most likely a cytospora canker is one we see quite a bit. Uh, and it, 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 if you can just try to maintain uh, adequate moisture, that's going to be your, your, your best treatment to avoid cankers in trees. 
All right, and you have one more picture, Lauren. This comes to us a little bit south of Kearney. She knows she has cedar apple rust, but here sit the galls. And this is a mature <laughs> set of cedars. Is there any hope for control? <laughs> well, the, the best thing you could do in this case uh, is find the apple tree that's cycling this over to the cedars and cut it down. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck but you may that. want to get rid of the cedars instead, so yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you, Lauren. John, uh, this is uh, a viewer who has north wind switchgrass in containers, and he brings them into the garage and overwinters them. A couple have come back really well over uh, three years. One in particular is really struggling. He's wondering any suggestions or thoughts on that. You know, that could just be down to difference in plants of when you bought them, some were more thrifty or healthier than others. Uh, it could be individual genetic differences. So I would just, you know, sort of keep them um, going and see what happens. There's not really much you can do. All right. Uh, you have one picture on this next one, John. This is a non-blooming peony. It's a, it's a yellow one, so it must be an interspecific of some sort. Did not bloom. She did replant it. She's wondering, did she plant it too deep? And if so, when can she dig it up? And how deep should she plant it? Um, you could have planted it too deep. It could also be that when you replanted it, you just haven't had enough time to let it sort of mature. Um, what you want to do is sort of uh, dig that up and, uh, you know, uh, take a look and see. You should see where the the roots um, sort of join onto the stems and you don't want them, the stem to be underground. So you want the roots just to be right uh, at the ground level or a little bit under. All right, uh, one more picture, John. This comes to us from Lincoln, uh, moved in. She's got three of these shrubs. It is Wygelia. She says they all look like this where they've got this variegated piece and then they've got the non-variegated. She's wondering, does she remove the variegated or the non-variegated and what happened? Um, that's really up to you. So those are really unstable. So we have, uh, you know, when we breed, breed new plants, we breed all different kinds of traits into them. Uh, and sometimes we have sort of um, some recessive genes. Uh, and sometimes we can get these little mutations that allow those to pop out. So if you like it, leave it. Um, you could also, you know, sort of prune that out. Uh, it's, it's really not doing any harm, but it'll be very different than, than the plant that you planted. All right. Thank you, John. Well, you know, most people love tomatoes, or at least the people who love them love to grow them, and they don't like it when they get those diseases. So here's Kyle Broderick to tell us why those tomato leaves are actually curling. So we've been receiving a lot of questions about tomatoes with curled leaves. And unfortunately, there are quite a few reasons why tomatoes will have curled, have leaves that curl. We can have environmental reasons such as moisture, heat, nutrients. We can have uh, pathological reasons like viruses and there's even some insects that do it. So some of the environmental conditions that can lead to tomatoes with curled leaves. Well, excess heat. We've had a lot of excess heat this year. And that's as those leaves curl, they're, they're using less moisture and those curled leaves are actually absorbing less heat from the sun, cooling down the plant. And that's so physiologically, that's why those plants are trying to curl those leaves. Now, in addition we can, to the heat, we can also have some moisture reasons why we have tomatoes with curled leaves. Excess moisture, but also not enough moisture can, can really lead to those curled leaves. So as you're doing your watering, we really want to make sure that we are checking that soil profile um, with, with either a finger or a screwdriver to make sure that we do have adequate moisture out there and we're not just putting water on there for the sake of putting water on those plants. Having, um, having a consistent watering is really the best way to avoid that physiological leaf roll. You can also see leaf curls with, um, with some excess fertilizer. And so nitrogen is the big cause of, of that. But really any of these reasons why we would see environmental factors causing the, the leaf curl, typically those leaves are starting to curl from the bottom of the plant up. And those leaves, um, they may be a little bit leathery, um, maybe a little bit um, kind of just feel a little bit different than the leaves at the top of the plant do. We also may see those leaves uncurl 
in the morning, but then as the heat of the day goes on, we get those leaves to curl. Now, the, the biological reasons for leaf curl, such as insects or pathogens, is a different story. If, if, if we have any of our viruses, and tomatoes have a lot of viruses that can cause those leaves to curl, typically those symptoms are going to start at the top of the plant in the newest growth. As our viruses have to utilize the, um, the, the plant's own cell machinery to reproduce, that's where we see the most virus problems is in that newer growth. We typically will not see virus problems in the lower growth. Now, if it's insect issues such as mites or, or aphids causing those leaves, cur those leaves to curl, that might, may kind of be throughout the plant. So you may actually need to look at those leaves underneath, a, um, underneath some magnification to see if you can find those, find those insects. The final reason that we're seeing a lot of leaves curl right now is herbicide injury. There are a lot of herbicides um, floating around right now, not just ag for the agricultural sector, but also from urban landscapes. Most of our home, most of our home and garden herbicides include some growth regulators that can cause those leaves to curl. But with those, if we have leaf curl caused by a herbicide, that is going to occur at a single point in time. And so typically those leaves will grow out of it. And so we may have the leaves curl, but then I always recommend waiting two to three weeks to see is the new growth looking good. If new growth is looking good, then those tomatoes should um, come out of that just fine. Now we do have to recommend if you have a plant with, that has um, received herbicide drift that has already fr set fruit, we do not recommend consuming any of that fruit not knowing what exactly that herbicide is. So as I've said, there are a lot of reasons that can cause these leaves to curl. We just have to do some investigating and even send a sample into your friendly neighborhood plant diagnostic clinic if you need to. Well, hopefully that helps for all of you who have curly tomato problems. You know, the only way is to keep scouting in the garden. Remember all those farmers market people that grow tomatoes? You can eat them there. All right, so you have for the last picture round, Kyle, uh, this is Omaha. They found this beautiful wasp, bright iridescent blue-green body and wings, wants to know whether they'll find a nest and are they good pollinators? Um. So I think it's um, you know, a common blue mud dauber, most likely, especially if it was found uh, around dwellings. Um, probably not a great pollinator. The, the adults do, um, they do visit flowers to, to get nectar, but probably not providing much pollination. Um, but I think they're still, you know, they're kind of good to have around the landscape. They're solitary, they're not really a problem. Um, they're not aggressive or anything, and they, they actually provision their nests with spiders, so they paralyze spiders, and, and that's what the, the larvae feed on. So you, you could find a nest around. They like to build, like, they build a, a mud nest, um, often like under eaves or something like that, um, in, uh, around your house or garage, that, that sort of area. That could be where you would look for it, but um, not anything that's going to be, you know, aggressive or, or problematic around. All right, uh, one picture on this next one. A little cool, strange holes. This is West Point, Nebraska. What is it? These are our antlion pits. So the uh, antlions, they, the adults, they look a lot like um, like a damselfly or dragonfly, um, but they're related to like lace wings. And so the, the larvae are, are like little lace wings, but they make these pits in sandy soil. And then when other insects are walking around and fall in that pit, they become unwitting prey for a little a little lion that's waiting down at the bottom of that pit. Right. And your final one, speaking of spiders and things, uh, this is uh, some sort of a spider. What is this? Yeah, so I, I don't think there's a common name for this, this genus, but it's some type of a ground spider um, based on the kind of long spinnerets on the back. So um, pretty cool little, little spider, but it's a spider. Yeah, it's a spider. Okay. All right. Uh, Rock, two picks uh, for this first one. This comes to us from Kennard, or Kennard, since I pronounced Prague and Prague wrong the other night and got yelled at. So, uh, obnoxious weed, and they have a wedding event. They wonder what this is and how to get rid of it. It's wild barley, which is actually one of the parents of cultivated barley. 
which you would have with hops and your ribeye steak and the Perth Plain salad we mentioned earlier. But wild barley is very tenacious, prolific cedar. It's a winter annual, so it is too late to do anything about it now other than hand pull it or hoe it, and it won't spread its seed uh, that aggressively. But if they got a wedding coming up, you certainly don't want people walking on that ground because it can be kind of spiky. All right, your next uh, two picks are from Pleasanton, and this type of grass is invading their lawn. She wonders what this one is and whether she should keep it or kill it. Uh, I would kill that. That's tumble windmill grass. Um, it is a warm season grass. It's very tenacious, especially in central and western Nebraska. It's moved into the eastern state, eastern part of the state aggressively because of the droughty conditions uh, we've been having. And there's only one herbicide. It can't be dug up very well. There's only one herbicide that's very effective on it called mesotrione or tenacity. Uh, you can buy this online or there's also a granular formulation that many of the garden stores will have on. I'd actually recommend the granular formulation only because you limit, it also has broadleaf activity, so you limit the potential for herbicide injury to um, non-target plants. All right, and Apparently it's a turf if you like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that not one's not good in salad. salad. Well, maybe if you're that hungry. It might be good with a ribeye. I think everything's good with a ribeye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rock. Uh, Lauren, you have two picks for this first one. This is from Oakland, Iowa. And they're wondering what these orange things are on their Buckeyes. And we just happen to see not quite this beautiful, but the same thing as we're wandering through Lawrence and Gardens today. Yeah, so this, this is one of our rust fungi on Buckeye. This one cycles from, I can't remember which grass, but one of the native grasses. Uh, and then goes to Buckeye, so nothing, nothing really to do about it uh, at this point. All right, uh, will won't hurt the tree totally. M most of the time, not. I've seen some severe cases, and even then, the tree's going to live fine. So all right, uh, you have two pictures for this next one, also, Lauren. This comes to us from Crofton. He has a 30-year-old uh, raspberry patch. He's never seen this before. He did say that some uh, of his other garden plants looked like some herbicide diff. Uh, drift, but the grapes looked great. Uh, and he's wondering, is this environmental disease or herbicide? Just just from the look of it, 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 it makes me question if it's not a, a leaf burn of some sort from maybe water or something. It, it could be, depending on what was sprayed, a contact burn, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't look this way. The other thing in looking at this, uh, run where it's an older stand, look at the canes of the plants that have leaves like this, and you may find some uh, lesions on the stems of those sort of the canes and that, that could be a uh, like an anthracnose infection or something that could result in those new growths burning at the tips like that. And if they see that on the canes? If he sees that on the cane, uh, it's, it's going to be difficult to manage. Uh, if it's a second year cane bearing raspberry, it's really difficult to manage because it's, it's going to be in the canes. Uh, if, it's, if it's something that's a first year cane bearer, they could use sanitation and cut that out in the fall. All right, and one more picture, and this is a beautiful fungus as well in uh, Nebraska City. Yeah, I believe it? this is one of our Pleurotus uh, mushrooms. Uh, there are many different species. Uh, usually this indicates uh, something that's dead, so most of the time these are on dead trees. Uh, if it's not and it is a tree in the landscape, it's a hazard tree. Does that go well with a ribeye steak? You could, well, I'm not going to say that. I, uh, you, you potentially could, but just be really careful about eating wild mushrooms. Uh, and, and there's too many things that look alike that will make your ribeye steak look different than it did the first time. So. Well, and as, as I tell people, you know, all mushrooms are edible. Some are only edible once. That's right. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. So be cautious right. with that. John, two pictures. This comes to us from Bladen, Nebraska. A maple with a vertical seam between two main trunks. Uh, there was a dog chain wrapped around one tree trunk, and it uh, did that. Sh uh, is there a concern about this tree crashing down? Uh, not immediately, but I think this tree is dead and doesn't know it yet. <laughs> uh, we have that big crack, uh, which is always a sign of damage. And if we had a dog chain that, that has grown into uh, that trunk, you know, all of our cambium, our xylem and phloem that takes water and food and nutrients up and down the trunk are right around that edge. And so I think that is damage that will eventually one day soon uh, cause that tree to die and fall. All right. Uh, unfortunately, we have a viewer from Omaha who has uh, three maples. They're about 12-ish uh, years old progressively worse with dieback on the top. He knows he needs to cut that dieback out, but he's wondering, should he 
fertilize these trees? I don't know that fertilization is going to help. I mean, you can do a soil test to see what's going on, but I think most of this damage is from just winter injury. Uh, and, you know, we're just seeing this a lot more, uh, especially with a lot of the maples. All right, and finally, you have two pictures on this next one. This is a viewer with burning bush or euonymus. It's gotten leggy and tall. He wonders, can, uh, can he prune this all the way back down to that newer growth at the base and potentially start this shrub over again? You can definitely give that a try. I mean, we don't know if it's going to work, but I mean, what is dead is dead and it's not going to really come back. So you can prune that out and if you like what's left and you see new growth, then that's fine. And if you decide to, uh, I guess, uh, prune it at ground level and dig it out, uh, that's fine too. All right. All right. Uh, thank you so much, John.